and I said, hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Lieber Ohio podcast, where the famed elixir of life may not be as elusive as it once seemed. I'm your host, Ryan Thomas. Welcome to the D program. Thanks for hanging. In this episode, my friend Beth joins me to chat with Eric Cassano, the proprietor of AquarianAlchemy.org, where he provides programs for breathwork, cold therapy, sauna therapy, and nutritional wellness. But, but, the impetus for his visit here is his use of urine therapy, what some call shabambu, in the treatment of his own cancer. And no, your ears do not deceive you, you heard that right, because for the longest time, Living men and living women had no need to venture outside of themselves for happiness and for healing because they overstood that the human body itself is the most magical machine that has existed and will ever exist. It is quite literally an alchemical laboratory that white coats and their sales reps will never be able to comprehend the inner machinations of. But as an alchemist, which I am proud to be, and which you are too, whether you identify as one or not, It's my obligation to myself and to you to present little thought chemicals like this. I mean, could it be that the famed elixir of life, that substance that seekers of alchemical secrets have long searched for, could it be that it's been here within us all along? Perhaps we'll have a better answer to that question after the chat, which begins right about now. Enjoy. Eric Cassano, the Aquarian alchemist himself. Welcome to what I call the deep program. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Ryan. No problem. And welcome as well to my dear friend and longtime podcast patron, Beth. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. And also, thank you for all the money you poured into this project over the years. I've actually been able to buy my cat some better food because of that. So she thanks you too. I'm glad to do my part. And um, yeah, I'm happy to, to join both of you. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. So Eric, your story, your journey to this point in your life, pretty amazing, pretty inspiring. And I think the best place to start is with your testicles. So, uh, but for real, that is the best place to start. So tell the audience out there what went on down there with you and how you dealt with it. Yeah. So it was about, uh, about nine years ago, I got testicular cancer in my left ball. And I would say it at the end of the day, like it came from a lack of love, emotional imbalance, overeating. Then again, I was also predisposed to it because I was born with something called cryptochism, which means one of my balls didn't drop when I was born. So even though I was predisposed, it just means I was at a higher risk of getting cancer. I could have still avoided it if I knew what I was doing at the time. But life happens. I became disconnected from my body, maybe uh, maybe going out and partying too much, you know, too many cocktails. And, uh, and overeating at night is also something that I think may have, have led to it. But really, it was just, it was from an emotional imbalance. So my late wife at the time, she actually is the one who found the tumor in my testicle. And she was like, I think you need to get that checked out. It was actually after my second Burning Man. And we were on our way home, staying in a hotel room. And she felt my ball just kind of casually and said, I think you need to check that out. And as soon as I felt it, I was like, fuck, it's cancer. And I could tell right away. And so obviously I wanted to, I mean, I I wanted to save it and not go down the Western route. And there's no recorded record of anyone beating testicular cancer naturally, but I believe it's possible. At the time, I didn't know how to do it because I was pretty new to detoxification and holistic healing. So I did go to the Western route. I had my left ball removed. And then I did something I promised myself I would never do, and that's chemotherapy. Now, the chemo did nothing. I'm convinced the surgery, getting my ball removed, bought me time. You know, it um, saved my life, so to speak. But it doesn't really heal the karma. It doesn't change the imbalance in my body. So I still had to figure that out. So after I did chemo, which was ridiculous, the doctor said, sorry, you still have cancer in your body. We want to take out your lymph nodes. And I said, no fucking way. I, I'm done with you guys. You know, you've already screwed me up with the, you know, with the chemo. And I told you I didn't need it. So, you know, chemotherapy damages your DNA throughout your whole body. And with the hopes that your body will repair the DNA. So after the chemo, that's when I realized I actually had a dream that I needed to begin urine therapy. I needed to begin Shabambu. I needed to begin drinking my pee. And it just, it clicked. It made sense. But I didn't really know how to go about it. 
so I'm online. You know, I'm, I'm trying to beat this cancer thing. I don't want to get my lymph nodes removed. I, I was still getting CAT scans and I wanted to show the doctors and show myself that all my lymph nodes would go back to normal. So I found somewhere online that said, you have to fast on urine in order for it to work. And that's when it clicked. I said, ah, fasting on urine. Now I get it. You got to go hardcore with it. So I fasted on my urine for the first time when I was 29 for uh, three weeks, not that long. Uh, I had a little juice every day, but every drop of my Shibambu, my elixir of life, whatever you want to call it. And after the three weeks, it felt as if my DNA was healed. My body felt normal. My thoughts were nice. I had energy. I was excited about life. Actually, what it gave me was self-love because initially, almost all cancer is a lack of self-love. It's like inner anger. It's it's just, that's what cancer is. It's it's like the, the karma disease, I like to call it, because it's it's usually very internal. It's usually not from, I mean, yeah, it can be from external sources, but it's, it's usually an internal thing. So after my three-week urine fast, I had this self-love and I had this knowing that I was going to be okay. And I, I did one more CAT scan. They said, all your lymph nodes went back to normal. And then after that, I was done with Western medicine forever. I said, well, this Shivambu stuff is amazing. Uh, why would I stop now? I mean, it feels too good. It feels right. I can't explain it except that it's working. And then I kept going down the Shivambu rabbit hole and it's deeper and deeper and deeper. I mean, especially why this has been hidden from us and how great it actually works. And there's so much more that you can do with Shivambu than just fast on it or drink it. It goes deep. You know, there's uh, beliefs that the philosopher's stone an elusive red rock. If you eat it, you'll live forever. But now I've come to find that you can create a, a philosopher's stone bath or what I call the rite of the sepulcher or the Shibambu sepulcher. In other words, saving up 40 gallons of your own urine and bathing in it. That's what I believe is another version of the philosopher's stone. It's something that Jesus's grandmother, St. Anne, used in this book that was channeled by Claire Hartsong. Claire Hartsong channeled that St. Anne used this Shibambu sepulcher in order to rejuvenate her body so that St. Anne lived uh, maybe a thousand years. I and mean, she lived well past 600. And in this book, it's very fascinating because they don't call it urine in the book. They say that, that Anna laid in a amniotic-like plasma fluid. And that to me, <laughs> an amniotic, like as she said, I'm sorry, it was a, a living plasma fluid with amniotic like qualities is, is I think how she quotes it in the book. So as soon as I read that, I'm like, oh, aged urine. Hello, because what's an aged urine? Stem cells. And I've seen people with wrinkles begin to use aged urine on their face in a few weeks or at least, or I mean, at the most, a, a couple months, their wrinkles go away. It's incredible to see what just a little bit of aged urine can do on the skin. So imagine if you're uh, fasting and you cover yourself in aged urine, your skin will eat the stem cells and it will rejuvenate you. It, it goes deeper too. Ryan, have you heard of the book, The Water of Life? Yeah, yeah. I actually downloaded the PDF of it. Excellent, excellent. I've read some of it. I just, I just got it again and I'm ready to read the whole thing. But I was reading that a little bit 10 years ago when I had cancer and Dr. J.W. Armstrong, I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple technique. He basically says, if you want to cure anything, fast on your own urine and rub aged urine on your skin three times a day. And that, that's it. That's the same protocol for everyone. And he says, I don't even think a urine fast will work unless you rub aged urine on your skin as well. He went that far. He said, he said I really think the key is, the, is putting it on the skin as well. So if you take that science or if you want to call it a fact or a theory or whatever you want to call that, if you take that bit of information and you compare it to what St. Anne said in this channel book, it's quite incredible. It's really the same thing. You're fasting while you're soaking in aged urine in order to rejuvenate the body. So it, it doesn't seem so far-fetched that we can rejuvenate ourselves with our own living fluid. For sure. I have about 700 bullet points on Shivambu that maybe we can get to a couple of them. But before we get further into that, I want to go back to the cancer. 
I've heard a lot of stories about men who go through an experience like you did, and they say they lost a sense of themselves. They lost a sense of their identity as a man, their masculinity. Did you struggle with that? A little bit in the beginning, because clearly that's where we get our testosterone from. But with Shivambu and drinking my urine regularly, it actually gave me something that I wouldn't have had unless I lost my ball. (laughs) It gave me a sense of confidence that is unreal. And I mean, I didn't start talking about Shivambu online for the first few years, at least. I was doing it for at least three years before I was like, hey guys, I'm doing this, you know, because that takes a lot of balls. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) there's hit pieces out against me that I've been made fun of online, like nobody's business. And honestly, it's a badge of honor at this point because I know like I'm fighting for fighting, if you will. I'm uh, fighting for people's medical sovereignty. And I mean, that's a beautiful thing. So while it did take away a little bit of my my manhood in the beginning, I also noticed that Ambu gave me more testosterone. It healed my other testicle and it made my other testicle even stronger. So in the long run, it didn't take away I don't feel like it took away my manhood and another thing that's really helped me with my manhood is ice baths and I like to make the joke that doing ice baths and breath work turned my remaining testicle into super testicle and so did the (laughs) shivambu so it's really like like not everybody wants to hear my story not everybody gives a shit it's too heavy for some people to know what I went through and to know the healing that I found but certain people like yourself and other truth seekers are they're inspired by it. They think it's cool. And if I can find this much healing with one testicle, imagine what you can do with two, you know? <laughs> so I'm just here to, <laughs> to share the good word. <laughs> That's a great question. I appreciate that. No problem. And so I got to say then, you know, I've been observing the reaction to your interview with Alpha Vedic back in October. And to say that the idea of Shivambu, to say that it was met with some fervor by their community is a bit of an understatement. The conversation was so potent, actually, that you created your own Telegram channel for it. And there's also been some lively conversation in there, too. And while I don't want to make this chat all about Shivambu, because we've already touched on some things that, you know, breath work and cold therapy that we want to dig more into with you. But I do think it's important then to just kind of lay a foundation for the listeners who are still unfamiliar with it, especially as it relates to the alchemy of it, because that's really that's kind of where the, the sexy juice is for me, you know. And so let's start back at the beginning, you know, so from what you know, how far back does urine therapy actually go? I can only tell you what I believe about it intuitively. This is something I made up. I like to say it's the first medicine and it's going to be the last medicine. I don't even know how ancient it is. To me, intuitively, it feels like the most ancient form of medicine possible. And I don't know, to be honest with you, it's uh, a lot of great yogis, you know, apparently all great yogis use it. And that's what my teacher Mahesh told me. And Mahesh's teacher was Leonard Orr. And Mahesh was a, uh, a monk in India for seven years. And he knows how deep I'm into it. And he's like very casual about it. And he knows I'm really into it. And he's like, oh, yes, Eric, all the great yogis use it, you know, all of them. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So Shivambu does break down, I guess, etymologically to the water of Shiva. So there's that word Shiva's in Shivambu right there. And I know Shiva is the god of meditation and yoga, but I I must have missed the memo on the whole urine thing. But there's a great story actually about Shiva and his wife Parvati, and she's asking him why he looks so good. And I I guess now we know why, right? But (laughs) Shivambu is also spoken about by Shiva as, at least in my recollection of it, and I might be getting this wrong, but I think he talks about it as this really sort of occulted knowledge that's only for a select few. Does that sound right to you? That this is some sort of arcane thing, like only meant to be in the hands of those who are worthy of it? I mean, that's, that's interesting. I'm pretty familiar with the, you know, the Shivambu text where Shiva's talking to uh, Pravati. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. He does say in that book, don't tell anyone. It's like the last line. He's like, here's how you do Shivambu and don't tell anyone. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. I, and I get it because, uh, it, uh, whoops. <laughs> but I also feel like people need to hear this and I'm like taking one for the team, so to speak. But I also tell people, keep it to yourself because you don't want the ridicule, the judgment. People don't understand. They're not that intuitive. I mean, first time I heard about it, I was like, 
I wasn't grossed out. I just kind of said, yeah, no thanks. Until I was in that situation where I'm like, how do I heal myself? And I mean, I intuitively, I think it is only reserved for people who want to take their life and consciousness to the next level. And, you know, not, not to talk, I don't want to talk down to anyone who doesn't want to partake in this. Anyone who doesn't use Shabamu can have a happy, healthy life. Can they live to be 600? I'm not sure. That might be impossible because the thing that makes sense to me about Shivambu, again, is the stem cells. You can't deny it. Even Google says Shivambu has stem cells in it. And it's the type of stem cells that can work with any cell in your body. That's the fascinating part. So, yeah, I do think it's reserved for some people who really want to know themselves. Mm -hmm. And it also seems very alien to me. Shivambu seems very... I don't know. I always get the feeling that it's very Syrian, you know, I, I don't know if there's any validity to that, but I also know that the, uh, that the Egyptians worked with many different stars and there seems to be this Syrian Egyptian connection with Shivambu that again, I don't, there's not too much text on this, right? I can't, it's hard for me to research if how much Sirius and Egypt and Shivambu is connected, but to me, that's what it seems like. And somehow Sirius, the star Sirius always finds me. I'm always staring right at it. And like coincidentally, especially if I'm doing Shivambu, I'm like, oh, well, what a coincidence. So you've mentioned stem cells. I think it's probably best to point out some of the other things you'll find in Shivambu. It's obviously 95% water, two to two and a half percent urea, and then two and a half to three percent of all these other things, uh, stem cells, nutrients, phytonutrients, enzymes, amino acids, polypeptides. Uh, hormones, including growth hormone. And something I just learned recently, you can also find antibodies in urine. So if you were sick for any reason, drink your own piss. And Eric, I know you could talk directly to that, but let's save that for the second hour because I don't want to give too much of that away yet. But back to the idea of, you know, this sort of being occulted, uh, maybe only for the people who want to get to know themselves. I got to say that there absolutely is, to me anyways, as I look out into the landscape of humanity right now, there's a rising in consciousness happening on this plane right now. Because I think just in the last year or so, I've seen a lot of people have hopped on this, you know, Shavambu Express or, or whatever you want to call it. But there's a lot more people who are interested in this modality. And I think that some of these lost arts seem to come back around into the consciousness when people are ready for them. And I think there's a lot of people who were just ready to get gold pilled. So on this point, then, do you think Shivambu itself is responsible then for raising consciousness? And if so, like, how could you explain that? I don't think it's responsible for it, but I think it feeds in and helps raise the consciousness. I think it's, it's deeper than Shivambu. I mean, to me, it seems like, to me, it seems Shivambu is pretty niche. It's pretty far and few yet. You know, when I look at like Monica Schultz videos, she has 100,000 hits, you know. Troy Casey's getting a lot of hits. And a lot of people, I think, are curious. And that's a start. I mean, there probably is some truth to what you're saying. Like, is Shivambu responsible for raising the consciousness? I, I think they go hand in hand. And I, it's been really fascinating seeing, like, someone mainstream on a liberal network, Daniel Tosh, who's on Comedy Central. Now, he's here making fun of people. And I remember a few years ago, he brought the urine therapy lady on his show, of course, to make fun of her. But it's amazing to get people like that on mainstream television so people can say, you mean you can drink your urine and not get sick? Because the consensus of the mainstream is you drink your urine, you'll, you'll die, you'll get sick, you'll get dehydrated, it'll, it'll hurt you, it'll hurt your kidneys is what I keep hearing, it'll hurt your liver. But it's really the opposite. So you know, this is a slow process. And I mean, this, it is a big deal because if more people realize that we're completely self-sufficient and like the body is capable of some amazing things, I mean, we could do amazing things with our body. Shivambu is just one of them. Then more people will start to wake up. Shivambu is a slow ripple effect because people who are most grossed out by Shivambu are, are people with, with really bad eating habits. And that's most of America. So most of America is pretty grossed out. Most of the world's pretty grossed out by Shivambu. But we're starting to plant seeds in the mainstream, on the internet. This is a slow process. So I'm, 
I don't know if I can give Shivambu that much credit yet. <laughs> I would like to say that it's responsible for raising the consciousness, but it's uh, it's definitely part of it. But I, I'm not sure if if we're there yet as a collective. But I mean, we got to start somewhere, and it's incredible that I'm on this podcast with you. That there are people interested in doing it. That, that there are small but powerful numbers of people beginning to do Shivambu, and we'll just have to see how it goes. I mean, that's a I appreciate that question. That's a deep, heavy question. I'm going to have to think about that for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm not sure I was talking about the collective consciousness. I think I was just talking about your own individual consciousness. And that just comes from my own experience. I've only been doing it for a couple of months. But I just feel like in the two months that I've been doing it, like I've changed considerably just in what I would call my levels of of consciousness. And, you know, I'm not saying that like me doing Shibambu is, is helping the collective heal or, you know, become more conscious or aware or whatever. I just know that in my own experience that it's definitely done that. So that's where that question was coming from. If you want to amend your answer, that's fine. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> sorry. I misinterpreted then. Okay. If you put it that way, absolutely. Without a doubt, it's changed my brain chemistry, my body chemistry, the way I feel about myself. It, uh, it makes you feel sovereign and safe. Like everything's going to be okay. I mean, especially if like, now I'm not, I don't have a, too much fear. I don't worry very much about things. But if shit went down and the power grid went out and things like that, you know, went down, then someone who does Shibambu, like, I would feel pretty safe because I know I could survive a very long time. <laughs> That's another thing it's added, which is pretty cool. But I mean, what it's given me is self-love and more energy and more confidence and uh, more testosterone and it makes sex better. It makes life better everything's a little clearer i really feel my consciousness raised with shivambu first of all when you regularly do it because i have taken days off or even weeks off and um and i always come back to it like why did i stop doing it for a couple weeks i feel so much better when i do it daily but when i snort it when i really snort it i really feel my consciousness raised i really just feel on a higher vibe you know happier more creative yeah there's a ton of different ways you can use this obviously I have a whole list of ways here that we don't have to touch on them all. You mentioned snorting. I actually want to get to that later because I think it ties into some breath work that we can talk about as well. But you already mentioned that one of the primary uses of this, just aside from drinking and using fresh urine, is this process of aging it. And I like to think that fresh urine has some alchemical potency to it somewhat, but aged urine, holy shit, this is deep, deep (laughs) alchemy here. What happens to urine when you age it? You know, break down that alchemical process for us. There's two very simple but important aspects of aging urine. Number one, the stem cells are multiplied. I heard by the millions. It would make sense. Number two, the pH levels rise every day. And those are two really important aspects of it. I can't imagine what other sort of juju is expanded whenever you, you age it or what kind of magic energy is, is just, uh, I don't know what else to say besides expanded. I mean, I, perhaps there becomes more antibodies or becomes more HGH and things like that. But what I do know, the pH levels go up and the stem cells go up. For me, that's the most important aspect. But it seems to also, like you said, uh, you know, fresh urine is amazing, but the age stuff it really boosts the immune system. I don't know what's in it scientifically. I haven't tested aged urine, but this needs to be done. You know, fresh urine has been scientifically tested. We can look that up on Google. But for some reason, science hasn't, science, you know, there hasn't been any good studies on what's in aged urine. But as far as the alchemy goes, when you pee in a jar and you let it sit, it has your DNA in it. So you know, quantum physics says that if you have two of the exact same cells and one cell is changed in one room, if there's a cell in another room, the other uh, cell changes automatically, even if they're in two different parts of the world. So whenever you age urine, your thoughts affect that jar of urine. So you can literally program it. And you really want to program it while you're taking a pee in the jar. But just if you're letting it sit for a month, then you can sit next to it. Really, you don't have to sit close to it but if you if you sit next to it and continue to program it you'll actually receive what you want whenever you consume it later that is magic that's that's unexplainable i mean that's the alchemy that i'm talking about i like to call it like a living crystal 
you know, I mean, people know about like programming courts and whatever, you know, I want to, you know, have a great day at work today. And you have a courts and you tell the courts that you put in your pocket and all of a sudden you have a great day at work. You're like, wow, sure. You don't need a crystal to make that happen. You don't need anything, but there is potency with some natural material things. And so urine is no different. Like I'm just saying words right now, but this is something people have to experience for themselves. This goes way beyond my words. You have to see for yourself if what I'm saying is real. But the urine is also very forgiving. It's also very healing. So even if there is some emotional baggage that your aged urine is is carrying from you, you know, you can always do things like put it in the sun, pray with it. You can put it in warm water surrounded by salt. There's so many different like cleansing techniques you can do to your jar of aged urine. So I think the real alchemy comes with the programming of it. Yeah, I actually have a bottle of it or a glass of it sitting in my window that gets regular sunlight next to a quartz crystal. So there's some there's some juju going on there with it. And I can see crystallized formations in the bottom of it. And I also think we should throw out the word Ormus. This is a heavily discussed topic in these circles, but it seems to be that there is your own Ormus is being made through this process as well, right? That's what I believe. And uh, a lot of that warmness, I believe, is from the foods you eat. It could also be a little bit of lymphatic fluid, but there's nothing toxic about it. So when I first found out that my urine had warmness in it, I kind of lost my mind because I was like, what? I was like, you mean I don't have to go to the store to buy warmness? I can just pee it out. But then I started experimenting with it. And it tastes the same as Ormus from the store. It looks the same. It smells the same. It's, it feels the same. It works with your mind the same. It's super bioavailable, which is, which is obvious. And it, it does like have this, it's like if you, if you buy Ormus at the store and if, if you put it in your mouth and taste it, it's like the most finest powder you've ever tasted or felt. So that's my water distiller. So the Ormus in your urine has the same qualities. But what I noticed is that that seems to affect the mind more. That seems to affect the mind and the liquid part of the uh, shabambu, you know, the red or the yellow or the orange part, that seems to affect the body more. While it's still going to affect the mind, the ormus doesn't seem to have like a great effect on your immune system. It seems to really just like help you manifest things. That part is magic. And I mean, this is something people need to experiment with and try the ormus themselves and see how it makes them feel. But it's, it's basically, the theory of Ormus is the fourth state of matter. It's not a solid liquid or gas. It has its own properties to it. And I've definitely seen that with the urine Ormus. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned earlier, aging 40 gallons worth to bathe in it. I got a five gallon bucket going right now. So I'm not quite to the 40, but I am in the process of aging five gallons worth of it. So I'm excited to see what that turns out like in a few months. And, you know, and I think what really gets me about this is that as I think about it, you know, we talked about consciousness, we talked about it, having your own DNA in it. This really is like your energetic imprint at any given moment of your life being upcycled back into your body. It's a literal feedback loop. It's alive because it can age and, you know, it's a fermentation process, right? And only things that are living can actually ferment. So this, this is quite literally alchemy taking place inside your body and then you upcycling that alchemical, I guess, product back into you for purposes of what we're talking about, for healing, for manifestation, like it literally is alchemy, it's magic, it's all of that wrapped into one thing, and you don't have to go anywhere to experience it. It's absolutely fucking free. So uh, Beth, do you want to say anything about this? I don't really have much to add, except just um, the ideas of, of Emoto around, I guess, informing water, placing intention in water. Something that's interesting about it is I think that maybe on the first go, Shivambu is more kind of repellent or I guess tougher for people to deal with. And the, the more that you kind of abandon that conditioning and just kind of open up to this, is, this is an okay thing and, and just sort of drop some of the stigma around it. I think that actually changes the quality of the Shivambu itself. You know what I mean? So it's not carrying as much of that sort of shame or disgust. It's not as loaded and it turns into something that's actually a lot more neutral. And that's consistent with Emoto's work with water, that you actually place a whole lot of your energy into it. And you're the one who's, who's kind of informing the water itself. And I'm also interested in that idea of like the spooky action. Basically what you were describing of the Shivambu being 
I guess, influenced by whatever your own experience is away from it, you know, just during the aging process, that it's still undergoing some kind of a, a similar or a parallel process to whatever you're experiencing emotionally or energetically. It's just really cool. I guess that's all I have to offer now. No, that's good because I had not considered the spooky action thing. I'd not heard anybody talk about that. So Eric, that's really cool that you pointed that out because it makes total sense. It's a part of you. It's a living part of you that's now living external from you as well. So you've got to be connected to it no matter where you're at. You know, if you're thousands of miles away on a vacation and you've got five gallons of Shivambu in your garage, like there's got to be some sort of, like you said, spooky action going on there. So that's a really cool idea to tinker with for sure. I'm glad you guys knew what I meant. I have one more thing I wanted to say about Shivambu. It's just a quick technique. If you want to like recreate the sepulcher type of idea, but with five gallons instead of 40 gallons, what you can do is be covered in cloth or like just like some cotton clothes or towels, whatever you want, lay in a bathtub and pour the Shivambu on you. So it soaks in your clothes and you can use way less Shivambu. And that way you can get the benefit of like soaking in a ton of it without using so much. Because that way the Shivambu will be soaking in the clothes. Because if you don't have 40 gallons and you pour five gallons on you, it'll just, it'll just run off from you. But if you have like towels on you or clothes, then, then the Shivambu can soak in the clothes and soak, soak in your skin on the clothes. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. So it's like, you're not wasting any, there's, there's no like excess that you can account for because you don't have as much. So, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. We'll come back to Shivambu in the second hour. I also wanted to point out here in the first hour, the work that you do at Aquarian Alchemy, which is a a great name. I'm super jealous of it, Uh, but this is your like health and wellness coaching business. And what I like about it, other than the name is you offer a core set of healing modalities centered around the four classical elements. You have breath work for air, cold therapy for water, sauna for fire, uh, juicing for earth, pretty clever way to structure it. And again, awfully jealous of it. Now, if I have one blind spot in my own health and wellness protocol, it would actually be a robust breathwork practice. I'm essentially just still doing basic box breathing here, you know, four, 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 four cycles. I also do four, seven, eight cycles, but I know that your breathwork modalities go far beyond that. You've trained in rebirthing breathwork, five element breathwork. A uh, holotropic breathwork. I don't know if all these are the same or similar or if they're different. So, you know, tell us a bit about what these breathwork modalities are exactly and where they came from. Yeah. So, holotropic breathwork and rebirthing breathwork are very similar. It's just different approaches to something called conscious connected breathing. So, conscious connected breathing is what the yogis have been doing for thousands of years to purify their lungs and their whole body. Now, Leonard Orr is the guy who coined the term rebirthing in the 60s. Stanislaus Grof coined the term holotropic breathwork in the 60s as well. Now, I feel like that's a bit of a hundred monkey syndrome, if you're familiar with that. It sounds like these two Western dudes found the exact same breathing technique, but they both found it in two different ways. The guy is Stanislav Grof found uh, holotropic breathwork because he was trying to recreate an LSD experience. So Leonard Orr, he was, uh, so back in the 60s, he passed out in a sauna and he had a rebirthing-like experience. He's like, wow, that was amazing. And then he started breathing deep in his tub and started having rebirthing experiences. And he said, this is the jam. So Leonard Orr went to India and he met Hadi Khan Babaji. And basically Hadi Khan Babaji said, you got it right. That's how we do our breath work. And then Leonard Orr trained with one of the most high level yogis of all time. So initially what this is, this is just conscious connected breathing and it's just breathing deep as you can, or they like to say about 90% lung capacity. I like to tell people to go, go hundred, but it's really, you do about 95% lung capacity fully in. And then when you exhale, you relax. So forcefully in and then relax when you exhale. And there's not a moment of retention. So you can do it through the nose, just the nose, which is most important because you want to create good habits and open up these nadis, the Ida and Bingala nadis in your nose. And whenever you begin to do this conscious connected breathing, if you do it for five minutes, you're like, wow, okay, that feels good. And it's incredible. But when you do conscious connected breathing for an hour and a half, 
that's when you have rebirthing like experiences. That's when you begin to release old karma, old patterns, old traumas. And it doesn't just release things, it strengthens your nerves. And again, rebirthing or breath work is initially detoxification. It's the most potent way to detox the body is through breath. And that's why, I mean, science tells us uh, we detox 70% of everything out of our breath, 20% out of our sweat. I think it's 7% out of urine and 3% out of uh, defecation. Conscious connected breathing. That's really the term I want everyone to, to learn here and look up what conscious connected breathing is. And that's just deep breathing without any retention, without holding your breath. The moment you've inhaled, you're exhaling. The moment you've exhaled, you're inhaling. No moment of retention. It's like circular, not to be confused with didgeridoo circular breathing, but it is a type of circular breathing. And the more you do this, then the more you'll be breathing deep naturally without even thinking about it. So the more you breathe deep consciously, then you'll start breathing deep unconsciously. Well, you mentioned, or sorry, I mentioned five element breathwork in that question. What is that? Is that different than rebirthing and holotropic? Is it the same? No, it's a great question. Okay. So when you do a rebirthing session, you're doing rebirthing with the air element. Now, if I do a rebirthing session buried in the ground up to my neck, that's for the earth element. If I do rebirthing in a hot tub or a hot bath, that's for the water element. If I do rebirthing next to a fireplace, that's for the third chakra. We already went over the fourth. And then the fifth would be doing rebirthing in a hammock. Now, that's five element breath work is doing it with the different elements throughout the week or whenever you want to do it. It's going to alter your consciousness in a different way. Doing rebirthing next to a fire, that really burns deep karma. I mean, depending on your, tr I mean, we all should get down with every element, <laughs> you know, but each element has a different healing thing to it. So for example, if people have a lot of religious trauma and they're very programmed by, let's say the church or whatever, and they want to get through that, then doing rebirthing in a hammock can be very effective because it makes them feel very etheric. And because they're suspended and they're, they're not on the ground, they'll start feeling like they're floating and they'll have a very etheric experience or start talking to angels and they'll realize that it's not about the church. So if people like me who aren't very grounded, I, uh, I benefit greatly from doing rebirthing buried in the ground. For me, that helps me get things done more. Because I'm so etheric, I have to ground more. And uh, that's incredible. I've only done rebirthing in the ground, like only done it like three or four times. And it's, it's awesome. I've done a lot in the tub. Doing rebirthing in uh, warm water is one of the most important because that is why it's actually called rebirthing. Because it feels like you're coming out the womb again. You're recreating the womb space. You're in the warm bath, the warm water. But one thing that would really be next level. Now, I haven't heard about anyone doing this. If you did rebirthing in a warm bath of Shivambu, that would be nuts. I haven't read about that anywhere. And then again, fire is really good for cutting deep karma. But rebirthing with the air element, that is your precursor. We call that a dry session. And Leonard Orr recommends 10 dry sessions before you start going to other elements. So Beth and I are both Scorpios, which means I think we're just very watery by nature. Would you recommend then like probably rebirthing via sauna or fire for us? Yeah, absolutely. But you have to start with dry sessions. And I wouldn't do rebirthing in a sauna. Uh, the sauna was just linen or sort of like initiation. It's just that's what like he pushed it too far in a sauna. And that's what like got him to uh, to want to go deeper and, and understand the safe ways of doing rebirthing. But I would say for any anybody, you have to start with dry sessions. As soon as you start with dry sessions, then you can start going to other elements. Okay, cool. Beth, do you have anything on this so far? Not really. I just, um, I'm interested in hearing at some point more about DP Mahesh, I think is the person who you, you learned from. Yeah. Right. And so I looked into him a little bit and I know that not just Leonard Orr influenced him, but also Edgar Cayce. And I wanted to hear at some point whether you could share any insights about how Casey influenced D.P. Mahesh. I'm going to have to ask him that. That's really cool. I didn't know that. But Mahesh is a, uh, he's a brilliant guy. And for a little while, they have an Indian book of world records. And Mahesh had the world record of being able to remember the most amount of numbers. 
So Mahesh is like a stocks guy. He loves, he's, he's in the stocks and business, but you know, he's also, he's also a monk. So that's also, that's what I love about Leonard Orr is that they're like business money guys, but they're also moral, ethical, and, and they're in the healing business. They're in the enlightenment business. For me, for the longest time, I, I thought they were two different things. I was like, you can't have them together. But I guess because they're so clairvoyant because of, <laughs> for whatever reason, because they've been blessed, they straddle that line. But uh, no, I'm sorry. I, I can't answer that thing about Edgar Casey. That's, that's really awesome, though. Well, it's interesting because I know that, that in your story, you had basically received the information about trying urine therapy or trying Shivambu. And that's really channeled wisdom, for lack of a better word, right? I mean, it's some, on some level, that was provided to you, right? I mean, you had some kind of an insight or some kind of an intuition, but it seems like almost the same line of inspiration that Casey underwent. You know, whether there's something coming from some other source that's able to give really useful medical instruction or insight. So I, I thought that that was also kind of something in common with your experience and uh, maybe a link to DP Mahesh and his interest in, in Edgar Casey. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I wish I could answer that, but I'm going to, next time I chat with him, I'll ask him and, and we'll be in touch. And because that's, yeah, he's, Mahesh is, he's so smart, but he knows how to like get on anyone's level. He's very intuitive, you know, so that makes sense that he's a <laughs> fan of Edgar Casey. Especially in your case, you know, just that you could receive that information just because it is so tough, I think, for people to, to even like pass that initial hurdle of, of just disgust or rejection of just being like, what? I'm not going to mess with urine. You know, that that was almost uh, kind of bypassed because you had received that, that information in such an unconventional way. Like nobody prescribed that to you. You just received it. Well, I mean, I remember the first time I heard about it, I was on, it, this was 10 years ago and I was on YouTube and a link came up and said, heal any disease right now, click here. And I clicked on the YouTube link and then it was this thing about urine therapy. And I just said, no, thanks. But then it went into my brain and then I became fascinated with it. And I was like, Ooh, I want to try this one day. And like most people, I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to do this, I have to, I have to juice for a month. I have to clean out my system. That's what everybody thinks. They think that they can't jump right into it, but they can, but I wanted to clean out my system, but I never really did. And it just sort of sat in the back of my brain, but I didn't think much of it. And so when I got cancer, the moment I got cancer, I wasn't like, oh, you're in therapy. You know, I, I wish. No, I was like, oh, what am I going to do? I have to change my diet. How am I going to do this? And I said, well, I guess I'm just going to have to go the Western medicine route and get my ball removed. So after, I think it was after I got my ball removed, that's when I had a dream that told me, and it wasn't like a big detailed dream. It was like, it was just a flash that I could remember. And it, the dream was just like, you're in therapy. It's good. And it was just, all I can remember is this, it was the feeling and the message, urine is good. And I remember the colored gold and it wasn't anything detailed. You know, I love the lucid dream and stuff, but this wasn't that. And I woke up thinking like, urine, good. And I wrote it down. And that's when I knew I had to pursue this, but I didn't know how. The internet was a better place 10 years ago. <laughs> there was more information. It was more uh, the wild west 10 years ago. You know, that's when I started finding some amazing testimonials on YouTube of people doing urine fasting, of people writing about it, and it started clicking with me. But even though I did have the intuition to like do this, I didn't know, I didn't have the instructions. But that's when I found uh, this guy, Liver Flush Man, and he's now taken down all his videos because he doesn't want to be responsible for people. He had, Liver Flush Man is the one who, on his videos, he showed everyone, he showed me how to ferment urine, how to make ormus out of it, how to do enemas with it. And I'm watching this guy and I'm like, this is gold. This is incredible what this guy is sharing. But all his videos had like 200 hits, 300 hits. That's it. You know? And I'm like, I'm like, I must be his biggest fan. So I've taken his work and I've spread it around to more people. And, you know, he definitely gave me the blessing and told me to do it because he said he doesn't want to be responsible anymore. And, I guess it was, I don't know, uh, it was it was too much for him to want to keep up with it. He did his part, but everyone plays their part, you know, and I'm so grateful for this guy. His name's Jordan Blakey, the liver flush man. And maybe some of his stuff is still floating around online. But uh, that guy really brought my urine therapy to another level and, and therefore brought a lot of other people's Shivambu journey to another level. 
Yeah, I'd love to track him down and get him on the show because he's on my list because I did watch some of those videos. I think I found a couple on BitChute actually too. So I think somebody out there is trying to preserve some of them. But Beth brought up a great point about Casey and this channeled wisdom that you got through a dream. And then you also mentioned, I think, lucid dreams too. And I think that's a good sort of topic to wrap the first hour on here is I know you've done some lucid dream work, but beyond that, I don't know the specifics of it. Yet I'd still like to ask you about it since it's kind of on the table here. So what is your experience like or your, I think maybe you offer some like a workshop or something through your business too with Lucid DreamWorks. So tell us a little bit about what your experience is like in that area. Yeah. Well, first I just want to tell everybody if they want a course on Lucid Dreaming, I'm about to release it and just sign up to my newsletter at aquarianalchemy.org. And I have this Lucid Dreaming course coming up, but let's talk about Lucid Dreaming. So I was never lucid in my adult life until I got cancer. And I went to go do my cancer therapy in Sweden. And so before I, and that was 10 years ago. And before I left, I remember I found this book, A Field Guide to Lucid Dreaming. And this book was my initiation into lucid dreaming. And when I did my first round of chemo, I was really scared of chemo because I thought it was going to mess me up spiritually. I thought it was going to break my connection from God. And while it does affect it, when I, I had my first lucid dream after the chemo, and then it was that moment I realized I was going to be able to heal myself fully and one day give up me Western medicine completely. So there's some pretty simple philosophies into how one can become lucid. So first of all, the easiest way to become lucid, if you want to just skip all the blah, blah, <laughs> if you want to have lucid dreams every night, all one has to do is wake up before the sun rises and sit in silence for an hour or two. We can call that meditation. We can call it sitting in silence. We can call it concentration. But if you wake up every morning an hour or two before the sun rises and sit still, then you're going to get on the, what is it called? Circadian rhythm. And you're going to sleep better. And you're just going to be more aware at night. And lucid dreaming is a byproduct of doing yoga real yoga, not stretching, but meditating before the sun rises, breath work, things like that. Now, there are other ways into lucid dreaming, and really it's about putting them all together. Dream journaling is incredible. It's really overlooked because when you're dream journaling, you're sending a message to your subconscious that you want to wake up in your dreams. And another very simple technique to becoming lucid is uh, something called a reality check. And uh, if anybody has read any books about lucid dreaming, they know about this stuff that I'm talking about. It's pretty basic. But reality checks are great. And reality checks can get you into the lucid state even without waking up early in the morning. So a reality check is just when you, like right now, you just say, you ask yourself, am I dreaming? And then you answer it, no. But you continue to do that all day, every day. And you begin to program your subconscious mind with that question. So eventually it trickles down into your dream and you'll be dreaming and you'll just naturally ask yourself, am I dreaming? Oh, I am. And as soon as you know you're dreaming, you become lucid. So those are like the three big ways into lucid dreaming. Now in my course, I give people uh, this breathwork guided MP3 or a guided breathing MP3. I call it the morning practice MP3. So in my course, I have people do Hatha Pranayama, Bastrika Pranayama, Tumo, which is Wim Hof, and then Conscious Connected Breathing. And then we begin to use our concentration. I created this guided MP3 specifically for this Lucid Dreaming course. I'm a musician, so I played all the music. It's all in the key of G sharp, which I call the nose chakra, in, uh, in 432 hertz instead of 440. And if you breathe along with my guided MP3 every morning, 5 a.m. or 4 a.m. Or, or whatever works for you, but ideally before the sun rises, then you'll easily become lucid because you'll sleep better at night. You begin to clear out your lungs through the, uh, through the breath. And then the music also opens your mind because, I mean, we all, we all know about sound, sound healing to some degree. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up music. I have some notes on that for the second hour because I know you're a musician. You're in a band called Shivambu, actually which is pretty fucking badass to me. I've listened to some of your music. You posted some on your Telegram channel the other night and I, I commented on it. I thought it was really cool. But last note in the first hour here on the lucid dream stuff. So there's this old story of 
people using honey right before they go to bed to induce a lucid dream state as well. That's where the phrase sweet dreams come from. You would take like a teaspoon or a tablespoon of honey or something, and that would help you enter the lucid dream state. I'm curious, like, could you do the same with Shivambu? Have you experimented with Shivambu at that point in the night? Or do you think that this aids at all in being able to access that lucid dreamscape? Yeah, I think Shivambu does help, but it's not a means to an end. It's it's not going to, it definitely helps clear the consciousness. And I know people who are deep into Shivambu and they claim they dream in 5D and stuff like that. But there's so much more that goes into lucid dreaming than just taking a substance. Like people who smoke cannabis all the time, if they do Shivambu, they might not lucid dream. People who sleep in really late, if they do Shivambu, they may not lucid dream. Everybody's so unique with this path. I don't think Shivambu works that way with lucid dreaming. But then again, it's all about intention. So if you put your intention into the Shivambu for you to lucid dream, that may actually work quite well. Just a side note, a particular substance that I have found incredible for more dream recollection and vivid dreaming. So vivid dreaming is not lucid dreaming. Remember, vivid dreaming is just like very clear dreams. Lucid dreaming is, you know, you're dreaming. But uh, something that can trigger lucid dreams and and definitely help you with your dreams becoming more clear is Tulsi or holy basil. And I think specifically the tincture, because the tincture is really potent. And if you make some Tulsi tea and put the tincture in it, that's really awesome. You drink that before bed. I have found that to be incredible for just experiencing longer, more profound dreams. But yeah, I do think, I do think Shivambu is also good, but I got to take the, uh, the Dr. Emoto route and, and program it with beautiful lucid dreams is what I would tell my urine. <laughs> and actually, actually, that's a, I need to do that. Yeah, you should. That's why I brought it up because I thought, you know, this is a living conscious entity. And if you bring in that, you know, programmable aspect of it, which you just mentioned, and then if I don't know if you had to take it throughout the day, or if you just take it right before bed, like these people did honey back in the day, if that would affect the dreamscape at all, I suspect it would, but that's that's just an intuitive thing. I don't know. I've not tried it either. Beth, is there anything here you want to add? No, nothing much else to that, except I'm going to drink some Tulsi tonight. That's great. Thank you. (laughs) For sure. So before we get too far away from the lucid dream stuff, I did want to ask you one more thing about that I meant to bring up a few minutes ago. And it was actually something that Beth, you shared with me privately. So if you want to build on this question or this comment, feel free. But we thought it would be good to ask you about dreams and lucid dreaming, especially where they could inform us about our health. Because what you were talking about in terms of you got this channeled sort of you know dream, or I guess this channel sort of information about the Shivambu through a dream. And that was obviously telling you something about your health specifically, what you needed to get healthier, to overcome your dis-ease in your body. And I was curious, like just from your own work on yourself and with other people, if you've noticed this as like a pattern that people do get this information through the, the lucid dream state and maybe even through just the regular dream state. And if we actually are just like, maybe it's not as obvious, like, oh, you must drink your own urine. Like, but is there like a, you know, like a symbolic language that we could decipher in our dreams that would unlock some of this, this information for us that could point us in the right direction for our own health and healing outcomes? So whatever you want to know, you can know it even without going lucid. So basically, if every night I say, please, God, angels, spirit, myself, you know, show me the answer to what I need to do to cure my flu. If you ask, if you real, if you sit with that and you really want it and ask for it, it will start trickling through your dreams. Anything you want, if you truly want it and you start programming your subconscious with what you want, you'll start dreaming about it. It's really that simple. I like to do visualizations, even if you're not like, so I'm not super visual, but I know how to get there. And that's why I'm like obsessed with lucid dreaming because I had to figure out, well, how can I be more visual? That's why I'm on this path. But we can also do visualizations in our meditation in order to find certain answers for our health. And me and my girlfriend, we've been, uh, we do these really amazing visualizations where we find out what we need to do for our health. And so this is just an example. I just want to give you guys an example. I know you asked about dreams. We'll get deeper into dreams, but I want to talk a little bit about doing visualizations while you're awake. So, in order to receive certain information, first you use your imagination to 
paint a picture in order to receive the info. So the imagination is the bridge to the spirit realm. It isn't the spirit realm, but it's the bridge to get there. So, for example, we talk to this guy. <laughs> I think I mentioned him on my Telegram group, Dr. Shiva. He's the Native American version of Shiva. My girlfriend is very visual. So she comes back with like complete like chant, like it's a movie. She has so sort of details. She receives really great information. For me, my visuals are a little more cloudy and I'm working on them. I'm working on it. So for example, I had allergies a couple months ago and I visualized a TP and I walk in the TP and I visualize Dr. Shiva walking in and then I let it play out. So what Dr. Shiva told me and my girl is that there is, he pulled a, uh, a hairball out of my nose. In other words, I was too close to my cat. I was getting allergies from my cat. So we received this information uh, <laughs> while, while in our uh, waking life, you know, but that might be a little harder to, to pull off for some people, but it can work, but you have to use your imagination to paint the picture of the of what you want to receive. Ask the question, paint the picture, and then let the visualization play out. But if you want to do it more at night, I would say people's best bet is to, uh, to wake up early and meditate. Because once you start becoming lucid, you may not have all the lucid dreaming powers that you want. So if I don't go lucid for months, and then I'm lucid again, because I decide to work on myself and eat cleaner and wake up early, a lot of my abilities will be gone. I'm like, well, I can't teleport. But again, if you want to receive information in your dream state and you're not worried about going lucid, all you have to do is just think about it before you go to bed. Set that intention. Ask with humility. Say, I want to know this, please. And keep asking every night. If you don't get your answer the first night, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it every day. And eventually your spirit will talk to you. From a logical perspective, you're just programming your subconscious to receive information. So, you know, have a nice meditation practice before you go to bed, an intention setting. And I, and I think anyone can receive any answer they want. If, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 it does. Beth, do you have any thoughts on that? No, it's, I mean, it's, it's cool. It's just basically like, you know, developing receptivity in this really deliberate way. I like it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So, uh, Beth, anything to add before we wrap up? I don't think so. No, it's, it's been, it's been really cool. Like, um, and I'm really, yeah, I just really appreciate it. And Eric, like, thank you so much for, for sharing all that you did. I mean, not just like, just, just in the conversation and also just in your words to talk about something that's so, you know, taboo or sensitive, like it's really, really cool. And I respect it. Thank you. I took one for the team. <laughs> I mean, Hey, like we're all out there now, just on some level, like we're putting this out there. So I'm not ashamed to say that I've been doing Shavambu, you know, it's only been a couple of months and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm out of the closet. So whatever, don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's definitely been a trip becoming that guy in, in LA and like and people you know I haven't ever lost any friends being like hey I'm into Shivabu you know I haven't I've it's only helped my life in some reason and and at the beginning I like to say that I was open about it because it would keep the judgmental people away from me <laughs> and you got to be careful with what you wish for because uh if your in-laws are judgmental, you don't want to keep them away from you. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel the same way. Like it's not just going to keep the judgmental people away from you who are on a different frequency anyways, but it's going to attract people who are on that same frequency with you to you. Totally. Beautiful. Exactly. Right. And I think that's also a great benefit for it. So um, Eric, before we go, then tell people where they can keep up with you and your work. Yeah. Just go to aquarianalchemy.org and sign up for the newsletter. And uh, we've got a lot of cool stuff coming out. We're, uh, we're redoing the website and we're gathering a lot of great videos about Leonard Orr that I've been finding that are incredible. People have made just beautiful mini documentaries about his work and who he is and who Baba G is and was. And, and also I'll, I'm going to make a, a private Shivambu website, but just sign up to the newsletter and I'll keep you guys all posted. Well, thank you so much for all the time you've spent with us. Again, thank you to build on what Beth said. Thank you for sharing everything that you share. Thank you for the vulnerability uh, there in the second hour. I just, yeah, really appreciate when people can, I guess, make the space and then trust, trust us here, you know, trust me to hold that space for you. So that means quite a lot. So thank you so much. 
Thank you. You did a, you did an amazing job and thank you for, for asking me to come on and, and being so cool about everything. And, and thank you guys and Beth for sending me such good vibes and, and yeah, I appreciate y'all too. So that, that was a lot of fun. Thanks again, both of you, and especially Eric, like, thank you for just kind of just sending us into a lot of different directions. It's just very inspiring, I guess is what I want to say. Thank you. I'm glad we're all alive to hang out and talk about it. How lucky are we? Thank you. And there you have it. My thanks again to Eric Cassano and to my friend Beth for the lively conversation. And my thanks to all of you who had the courage to give this a download and made it all the way to this point. I tried to set this up in the intro with a lot of alchemical spin. And even in the title of the episode, use that word alchemy because I wanted to indicate that this topic, to me at least, is about much more than using your own urine to combat a health issue. But even at that level of health issues and treatments for them, if there's one thing I've learned about reversing dis-ease in the body, it's that the modalities to do so are much, much simpler than we think. But going beyond that, and looking at the alchemical process, and at the goal of that process, I can't help but see the parallels between the language used to describe that goal and urine. The word gold gets bandied about a lot, as does that phrase elixir of life that I referenced in the intro. And if we're going with this Occam's razor style of approach, where the simplest explanation is usually correct, well, you may be brewing the philosopher's stone every time you lift that toilet lid. And yes, I know, I know, some of you may be disgusted by the very idea of this, and that's fine, that's fine. I know it's not for everyone. But again, my goal here is to challenge conventional thinking, to present other ideas and ways of being, and to encourage freedom from that matrix control system. And this subject is firmly in that wheelhouse, you have to admit. Of course, there are always other ways to approach health issues, and with that in mind, the next couple episodes are actually going to get us back to a more foundational approach, i.e. a more non-urinary approach, <laughs> to how we can do that. Anyways, in the second hour, Eric, Beth, and I chatted about Amanita muscaria and psychedelic urine trips, the unconscious death urge, the power of positive affirmations in overcoming that death urge, the overlap between the work of Sigmund Freud, Wilhelm Reich, and Leonard Orr, one of Eric's mentors. We also chatted about clearing out emotional energetic pollution in the auric field, Leonard Orr's idea of immortality, misapplication of Orr's rebirthing breathwork techniques in the death of Candace Newmaker. Eric told us how he used Shivambu for, let's call them, seasonal illnesses. We also talked about Shivambu and the primovascular system, using Shivambu with Brown's gas, Shivambu and the Bastrika breathwork modality, and we wrapped the chat with a bit about Eric's band and recording music at 432 hertz. So you can hear the rest of that tune and all other full tunes on Patreon or Substack for 7 bucks a month. Links are in the show notes. I am going to give new patrons a free month when they sign up for the paid show on either platform, and I'll let that deal ride through the end of January here. I've already had several people take advantage of that, so my thanks to them for doing so, and I'll probably do that or a variation of that deal at other times throughout the year. But that's another marketing plug for another time. And speaking of time, it's about that one. So until we meet again, you know what to do. Love yourself, think for yourself, and reclaim authority. Authority.